Welcome to the Casual Birder Podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take time to watch birds as I go about my daily tasks. In my show, I'll tell you about the wild birds I've seen, speak with other enthusiasts, take bird walks, and share stories from listeners around the world. In episode 77, I'll be sharing my thoughts on the virtual bird fair, inviting you to participate in the upcoming Global Bird Weekend, giving an update on my garden birds, and telling you about my visit to a local nature area. And there's some exciting news about a group eBird account for the Casual Birder podcast. Due to the pandemic and requirements of social distancing, this year's bird fair was reimagined so that it could be held online in mid-August. Many of the events and activities found at the in-person bird fair had their counterparts represented online, with panel discussions, authors' forum, talks, art gallery and auction, and the Wild Zone, with ideas and inspiration for the younger nature enthusiasts. Of course, it could never replace the excitement and buzz of being at the site in Rutland, surrounded by people who love birds and nature, making new friends, working out which talks to miss because of clashes, and that desperate speedy walk across the site, sometimes in very muddy conditions, to make it to the next lecture, getting lost on the way because, even though I have a site plan, I can never work out where I am in relation to the legend. However, the virtual bird fair was very well organised, and a big plus was that it was possible to see every event that was programmed. I attended many of the live streams, including discussions on climate change and women in conservation, and a panel featuring the new generation of conservationists was particularly inspiring. There were over 100 talks, interviews and presentations on topics such as nature on our doorstep, conservation efforts to protect vulnerable species, overseas birding trips and photography workshops. And here's the wonderful thing. If you missed it, the discussions and presentations are available to watch on the Bird Fair website for the next two months, taking us into November 2020. Access to the talks is free, but if you are able, a donation to this year's conservation project for the endangered helmeted hornbill is appreciated. In addition, there were live bird watching sessions from Africa and locations around Europe. These were fabulous, and it was so exciting to see what might turn up. Seeing a vast flock of knot at Snettisham in Norfolk pushed this site onto my list of places to visit when times improve. A side note that Swarovski Optic were producers of those birding live streams, and they continued after bird fair with sessions in the United States, Asia and Latin America. All of these sessions are available to view on their YouTube channel, and I particularly enjoyed and recommend the Latin American session. So many varieties of hummingbirds and other vibrantly coloured birds. But back to the bird fair, a big announcement. I was interviewed about my podcast by past guest Jamie Wyver from the RSPB for one of the bird fair sessions. I'd love it if you watched. Let me know if you do. You can tweet to tell me. The links to all of these are in the show notes. While watching the online discussion panels, some of us took part in live chats alongside them. In one of these, the challenges faced while birding came up, particularly for younger birders or for women birders. We recognised that we all had experienced them to some degree, being approached and feeling vulnerable when out birding alone, being ignored or overtalked by more experienced birders when offering observation information of our own, and feeling intimidated when entering a hide full of experienced birders. Now I know the majority of birders are friendly and keen to encourage others, but it was disheartening to hear that these issues continue to exist, and it's understandable that they dissuade some people from going birding. As a result, One of the chat members, Emily, took decisive action and created a Facebook group for women birders to seek birding buddies. It's called Women's Birding Group if you want to join. I know that more widely the concept of mentors or a birding buddy is being looked at by some of the birding organisations. Usually I prefer to bird alone or with my husband, but I'd be keen to take part in a birding buddy scheme where people can watch birds together as equals and share their knowledge and experiences so that we all learn from each other and together. From time to time, we've held virtual group bird watches for the podcast. I plan to make these events more frequent, and I've created a group account on eBird to allow us to collate the sightings. A quick note about eBird. It's managed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and is one of the world's largest science projects with over 100 million bird sightings submitted from around the world each year. 
Birders recall when and where they go birding and create a checklist of the species and number of birds seen. The data is used for bird population monitoring and conservation, education and for the science community. For the individual user, over time the records can be summarised to create trip, year and life lists. You can also explore birding hotspots, whether local to you or around the world, to see what other birders have seen in those locations. There's a free mobile app to enable you to record your sightings when you're in the field, or you can access it via a web page for adding your sightings later. Now, data quality is important, and there are protocols to be followed for entering the data. However, these are not too difficult for the average user, and there are clear instructions on the eBird website. To find out more, please visit ebird.org. The group account is called casual underscore birder underscore podcast underscore group. Yeah, I was really creative when I came up with that one. The idea is that if you take part in the group bird watch, you submit your own checklist to eBird and then you can share it with the group account. I think it will be really interesting and informative to bring together our sightings in this way. You can take part in the group bird watch without joining eBird, but if you want to contribute your sightings to the group account, you will need to create an account of your own, and it is free to do. The Facebook group recently held a bird watch where each of the participants recorded the sightings and quantities of their local birds for a minimum of half an hour, although some did it for much longer as they were out on walks or at birding hotspots anyway. The results were 242 bird species seen across the eight countries that were represented. That was Australia, Thailand, Finland, Lithuania, Serbia, Scotland, England and the United States of America. And the examples of species seen were Pied Currawong and Willy Wagtail from Australia, Coppersmith Barbet and Malaysian Pied Fantail from Thailand, Eurasian Tree Sparrow and Eurasian Bullfinch from Finland, Black Kite and Eurasian Penduline Tit from Lithuania, Black Woodpecker and Eurasian Wryneck from Serbia, Eurasian Curlew and Red-Throated Diver from Scotland, Dunnock and Long-Tail Tit from England, and White-Tailed Kite and Indigo Bunting from the United States of America, among many, many others. I grouped the countries depending on region, so we had three regions, Australia and Thailand, all the European countries, and the United States of America. And seven species were found in multiple regions. House Sparrow was found in all three regions. Collared Dove, Common Starling, Eurasian or Green-Winged Teal, Feral Pigeon and Mallard were all found in Europe and USA. And the Eurasian Tree Sparrow was found in Australia and Europe. Thanks to everyone who took part. Look out for more information about this and future group birdwatch events on casualbirder.com. The Global Bird Weekend is coming up on October the 17th to 18th to coincide with the October Big Day. During lockdown, many people discovered or rekindled a love of watching birds. This event, organised by Global Birding, eBird, BirdLife International and Swarovski Optic, aims to raise money to stop the illegal bird trade while encouraging as many people as possible to get out and see wild birds on their own patch. They especially want people to stay fairly local to take part to encourage low-carbon birding. Saturday, October the 17th is the day the birdwatch will take place. It's also the October Big Day, which runs from midnight to midnight in your time zone. But don't worry, you don't have to watch birds for the whole 24 hours. 10 minutes in your backyard would be great, but who can stop there? They're hoping for more than 25,000 people around the world to go out and watch birds, with a goal of over 6,000 bird species being reported. On Sunday, October the 18th, they're urging everyone to go to their favourite birdwatching spot and share it with others via photographs or drawing on social media. People can take part as individuals or as a team, and I'd love to put forward a team from the Casual Birder podcast and help raise money to stop the illegal bird trade. I'll be setting up a separate eBird group account for this challenge. As you share your checklist with the group account, we can watch the sightings roll in together. Let me know ASAP if you want to be part of it. Email me at casualbirderpod at gmail.com or let me know via Facebook. Check out the main website at globalbirding.org for more details. During the spring and summer, I've stayed home much of the time feeling extremely grateful to have a garden where I could enjoy watching my local birds. 
It's provided me with a connection to the natural world and given me a space to focus on things other than news reports. Mostly it's a place of calm and it's a space that I can control. I'd love to tell you that I really got into gardening during this time and that I'd created a beautiful wildlife garden. But at the time that I started to be inspired to do just that was just when everyone was locked down and materials could not be obtained. And then the year just seemed to run away with me. Instead, we cleared out some of the ground elder and bindweed that had become rampant, planted a rudimentary edible garden with strawberries, salad leaves and courgettes, and created an additional patio at the top of the garden which catches the morning sunlight. This patio is nearer to the shrubs than our main seating area, and the birds prefer to be in those shrubs, so by sitting quietly out there, I was rewarded by birds continuing on their daily activities around me. I particularly enjoyed seeing the young sparrows bathing in a nearby water dish, mostly hidden from me by a large rhubarb plant, or the jackdaw strutting around the garden, sometimes just a few feet away. During this period, like many of you, I've experienced overwhelm at the pandemic updates, concern for family members, and for the horrific situations arising around the world. I felt powerless and sought comfort and escape just sitting in my garden and watching the birds. This goes a little towards explaining why I haven't released many episodes this summer. However, I have been working behind the scenes on gathering recordings, learning more about post-production, conducting interviews and keeping up with social media. I even attended a podcasting conference online. I've lots of new episodes coming up, including interviews with really awesome guests and some recorded bird walks that I took in America and Mexico when I was there last year. I hope you'll enjoy them. I want to thank the members of the show's Facebook group for continuing to share their birding experiences from around the world. Oh, and for watching my first Facebook live stream recently. I hope to make those a regular thing. I've had a good variety of birds regularly visiting my garden this summer. Nearly every day I see blue tits, great tits, goldfinches, house sparrows, dunnocks, a robin, blackbirds, magpies, one or two rooks, jackdaws, collared doves, wood pigeons, and of course, the red-legged partridge, which very much enjoys dust bathing in my garden. Also through the summer, I saw swifts flying overhead. None of them chose to nest with us this year, but then I didn't feel brave enough to play the swift calls to attract them. Next year, I'll speak to my neighbours and explain what I plan to do. I tried so many times to photograph or video the swifts, or even record them, all without success. But Natalie Todman from the Facebook group shared this recording from a video she took of a small group flying over. She said, It may not be the most melodious of birdsong, but the screaming of the swifts is one of my favourite sounds. The sight of family parties shooting across the evening sky is always a summer highlight for me. Watching them this evening and wondering if they'll still be here tomorrow. And the last ones I saw this year was on a trip to the London Wetland Centre in mid-August. My rook friend continued to visit every day until about two weeks ago. I am missing it, but I'm hoping that it's happy and healthy somewhere and just has other things to occupy its time now. Maybe it'll return next year. In its stead is a teenage rook from this year's fledging and it visits the garden for food and often sits on a nearby roof chattering. I love seeing it but it isn't interested in me, which is probably how it should be. Just dropping in to say that, amazingly, while I was editing yesterday, my rook friend turned up again. I was extremely surprised, but very pleased to see it. It did look like it had some quills on top of its head, so maybe it's been going through a molt and uh, kept away while that was happening. It hasn't been back yet today, so maybe it's just teasing me but I'm very happy to see that it is still around and it's healthy. I'll keep you posted as to uh, whether it continues to visit. Other visitors to the garden, but seen less often, were Jay, Greenfinch, Sparrowhawk and a lesser black-backed gull. More of that one in a minute. We've also had a welcome return from the hedgehogs and a grey squirrel. This is a slight digression from birds, but on the hedgehog front, I think there are five or six visiting the garden. I've seen one large one, two or three medium-sized ones, and two little ones all at the same time. While I'm standing outside waiting for them to turn up, I leave the kitchen light on so there is some way of seeing them in the darkness. 
There's no sure way of knowing when they'll turn up, but standing outside in the darkness, listening intently for their rustling under the usual neighbourhood noises, is actually a form of mindfulness. They enter the garden from one of the entry points, under the gate to the north side, or under the fence from the south side. From the gate, they run up the side of the house, and I sometimes hear them knock into a loose stone edging the patio, so I can track their progress towards me. If they come in under the fence from the south side, then I can hear them rustling through the shrubs, or sometimes see them running across the lawn to get to the food. They move surprisingly quickly. Sometimes I'll notice a movement out of the corner of my eye, and by the time I've realised what it is, the hedgehog has rushed past my feet. I have to force myself not to jump with surprise. On one occasion, I looked down and saw a hedgehog standing right next to my foot that I didn't know was there. I made an involuntary sharp intake of breath, and the hedgehog froze and looked up at me in the semi-darkness, just as I froze and looked down at it. After a moment, it turned and ran under the summer house. While I was waiting the other evening, a bird flew over in the darkness. I've no idea what it was, but it had squeaky wings. It didn't sound like any of the birds I'm familiar with, so I guess it'll remain a mystery. And a quick aside, while preparing this episode, I just looked out the window and saw a magpie fill its beak with suet pellets and bury them in one of our flower pots. And then it went and got some more and did it in a different flower pot. Then it picked up a peanut in a shell and shoved that into the lawn, pulling up four or five clumps of grass to put over the top to hide it. I don't think the suet will last its time in the earth, but the peanut may be a welcome surprise later in the year. Back in July, I had some drama in my garden with the unexpected arrival of a lesser black rat gull, which then seemed unable to leave. As I was making coffee that morning, my rook friend made its regular visit, landing on the railing outside my window, and I dutifully went to stand at my back door to throw out a handful of suet pellets, and while I was admiring the rook's glossy feathers in the morning sunlight, it looked up at the roof, perturbed. I suspected a red kite was flying over. But instead, a lesser black back gull suddenly landed in my garden, about eight feet from me. It landed awkwardly, with wings outstretched and onto its belly, possibly misjudging the step between the patio and the lawn, and thinking it was going to land on a level surface. I'd been hidden from it as it landed in front of me, but as it stood up, it realised I was there. The gull seemed unhurt, just surprised to see me standing in the doorway. That surprised feeling was mutual. The gull walked quickly away from me towards the back of the garden, and I regretted not having my camera to hand to recall this unusual visit. Fully expecting it to immediately fly out of the garden, I stayed standing at my door, waiting for it to leave. But it didn't. It walked around the garden. I think it was looking for a way to get out, so I slowly shut the door to avoid scaring it. But I did get my camera to record the fact that the gull was in my garden. I managed to get some photos and video of the gull through my kitchen window. Several times it showed signs of wanting to take off, but then it couldn't gain enough height. It looked healthy and was walking around okay, so I kept watch, waiting for it to leave. The goal just seemed not to have enough clearance to take off, even though we've plenty of staging posts for leaving the garden. It jumped onto some plant pots and onto a low wall, but then, despite crouching into a pre-takeoff, it didn't follow through. I decided to risk possibly stressing the gull by going back outside to open the garden gate in the hopes it would find the route between our house and garage out onto the front lawn. As this would mean going down a narrow walkway, I doubted it would choose that route without help, but I thought it would bring the best outcome for the gull. I waited until it walked behind the greenhouse, and I quickly opened the gate and then came back inside. As I returned to my back door, I saw the gull looking at me. Would it realise that escape was nearby? After about ten minutes of the gull wandering around the garden, and with one failed takeoff, which led to it flying into my back fence as it hadn't gained enough height, it seemed more and more unlikely that it would get out of the garden unaided. I considered the options. I didn't want to catch the gull and have to put it in a box, and as we were still in lockdown, I didn't want to have to take it anywhere. I went back outside. Given it a very wide berth so I didn't stress it, I went to the opposite part of the garden from the gate to encourage the gull to walk towards the exit. I really didn't want to stress the gull out, but I also didn't want it to be trapped in my garden. I walked up behind the greenhouse, and the gull saw me and started walking away from me and towards the patio. I honestly thought we would have several bouts of walking around the garden while encouraging it to find the exit, but it saw the open gate and the lawn beyond, and it quickly walked down the path between my house and garage and out onto the front lawn. 
I slowly followed to make sure I didn't panic it, and I got there in time to see it take off from the lawn and fly away. Phew. It was a new bird for my garden list, but I won't mind if it doesn't make a repeat visit. There's been a rook and a magpie seeming to hang out together in the neighbourhood. I think they're both youngsters. One morning during my bird watch, I noticed some great behaviour. Really interesting watching the rooks just now. A juvenile has been in the neighbourhood this morning, sitting on rooftops and chattering away to itself. Another juvenile came in just now, landed almost on the spot on the roof where the other one was sitting, so that made the first one have to move out the way. Then they both came into the garden to pick up some of the suet pellets that I dropped, along with the juvenile jackdaw, who stayed a respectful distance away from the rooks. And in the distance, I heard a blue tit give out a warning call, and that immediately made both rooks and jackdaw leave the garden and not just fly to the fence before checking things out, but actually fly away. So it's interesting that the rooks responded to the warning signal given by the blue tip. I couldn't see what the blue tip was alarming about. It sounded like it was several gardens away anyway. It wasn't close by. Just interesting observing the rooks interacting with other birds this morning. Oh, and the first rook has been in the neighbourhood a few times and there appears to be a magpie that is associating with it, or at least turning up when this juvenile is in the area and the magpie is a juvenile as well I believe there's a chimney pot a couple of houses over that has a metal guard on top and this juvenile has taken to standing on top and bashing the metal cover which I'm sure is a delight for the house owners who will be hearing that down their chimney I imagine the other morning the magpie was on the chimney stack and the rook was on the chimney pot and the magpie was chasing round and round the chimney pot Um, And I realised later it was seeing the edge of the rook's tail hanging over the edge of the chimney pot. And I think it was trying to do the magpie thing of bite or pull on the tail of a bigger bird. And um, it was quite comical because as the rook could see the magpie running round underneath it, it was turning round, which was in turn keeping the magpie running round because the magpie could see the rook's tail moving all the time um, around the, the pot. It was like a comedy act. It was brilliant and I really, really wish I'd videoed it. Anyway, these are the things the rooks are doing to keep me entertained in the mornings. And speaking of magpies, as we returned from a walk one day, we heard a magpie chattering. So, of course, I had to record it. made a few birding trips since lockdown started easing in the summer. We went to Farlington Marsh near Portsmouth. I didn't see any bearded tits this time, but I did see a fairly large flock of starlings and some sand martins. We went to the London Wetland Centre where I had a lovely slow walk, taking the time to watch and listen to the birds on the water. We had two visits to my new favourite RSPB reserve, Farnham Heath, where I saw a Dartford warbler and a spotted flycatcher and to a local nature reserve that I mentioned finding last episode, Old Down Park. More on that coming up. I'll be writing blog posts about each of these with accompanying photos taken on the day. So check out my website, casualbirder.com, if you're interested in learning more. During lockdown, I started investigating where I might be able to walk locally. I discovered on a map a green space not too far away that included a wooded path leading to farmland. Old Down Park is an area of open chalk grassland with young trees that were planted in the last 20 years. There's also a strip of ancient woodland to one side, with white beam, oak and sycamore. I recorded a bird walk on two visits that I made there. The first one was in early April. But despite it being a beautiful day with lots of bird song, it became very windy and the recording suffered. There was an information board near the entrance to the park, which told us a little about the history of the area and what we might find. OK, so this is Old Down Woodland Park which is just across the road from where I live and I never knew it was here and I've never been here before. There's wildflower meadows, a tumulus, a woodland walk and oh, that's the route of the old Silchester Road to Winchester, Winchester Roman Road. Oh wow, 
and it looks like we might possibly see woodpeckers, great spotted woodpeckers, jays, a type of butterfly, holly blue, and blue tits, birdfoot trefoil plants, and primroses as well. Gosh, this would be a lovely... Oh yeah, there's primroses over there. So this looks like a really good walk I didn't know I had, really close to home. Gosh, look, it's really open over there. We could see right across the hillsides uh, to the other side of the valley. So I've seen a few birds flying. I'm just going to have a quick scan round and see what might be here. I'm imagining we'll see buzzards and red kites today. It's a very blue sky, calm day. Right, so this is kind of like a path through a small field edged with bushes. It's a few scrubby small trees. Wood pigeon, two blue tits, yeah. another wood pigeon, so we have two wood pigeons now. So just going through like a little, are these hawthorn? Yeah. Going through a little hawthorn grove. Oh yeah, there's some rooks and jackdaws on the field just here. I thought I might have heard a greenfinch just then. It's a robin, just under that tree there. I've got quite a collection of jackdaws and rooks flying in to the field. Wood pigeon cooing in the woods. Magpie just flew over. Plenty of bird activity today. On that walk, I saw 16 species, including the red kite I'd hoped for, along with bullfinch, common wood pigeon, red kite, magpie, jackdaw, rook, blue tit, great tit, skylark, chiffchaff, wren, blackbird, robin, dunnock, house sparrow, bullfinch and goldfinch, which was a pretty good haul, I thought. I went out again on a sunny August day. There was hardly any wind that day, but hardly any birdsong either. I've come out for an early morning walk. Um, although it's not quite as early as I hoped to get out. I've come to Old Down Parkland, which is an area of wild space that I discovered earlier in lockdown. It's actually very close to habitation and to some construction areas and farmland, so it's really hard to find a space that's quiet and doesn't have traffic, planes machinery, people. But um, I'm in a field at the moment which is relatively quiet. Unfortunately, any of the birdsong that might have been around is also very quiet. While I've been standing here, I've seen two buzzards flying over, circling around and um, interacting in the air, sort of flying into each other and then away again. I just saw my first swallow of the year probably almost at the point when they're going to be leaving. I haven't really been out much this year, um, relying mainly on seeing my garden birds. I'm standing at the edge of the field. There's woodland, a small copse behind me, with elderberries in, and there are wood pigeons eating those berries. I can hear them rustling through the leaves, and every now and then one will take off an explosive burst. When we came out earlier in the year and looked through this field, we actually saw a hare, which was really amazing because we don't see those very often nowadays. Um, but the field is now full of wildflowers and thistles and quite high vegetation, and it would be impossible to see anything like that now. But I can see lots of butterflies, bees. Uh, I've seen some grasshopper things. I'm not very good with insects. There's been a couple of magpies at the edge of this field and I've heard a blue tit but at the moment it's very quiet. So far on my walk I've heard red kite and nuthatch which is lovely because I again don't get to see them very often. Hopefully on the walk back I might see one. I can see a wood pigeon balancing precariously trying to get the berries at the end of weak branches.
surprisingly peaceful in here right now. When I was walking up here, I just felt like all I could hear was traffic, machinery and people. It's actually really nice to be somewhere where it's so quiet. It's currently a blue sky, but about 60% covered with light cloud. So where the cloud is broken, I can see a really deep blue sky above. The cloud cover has meant that the temperature of the air has dropped a little bit. It was very hot when I first came into the field, but actually it's quite pleasant for it to have cooled down a bit. I'm going to continue my walk. Um, I'll check in with you if I find somewhere with some bird song. I did hear an unusual bird call while I was walking. Definitely heard a buzzard then, but I also thought something that sounds like it must be a pigeon or something, but I don't recognise the call. So I'm just going to walk up a little bit further and see if I can get a closer audio of it. The call was kind of like, ooh, 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 which I don't recognise. I managed to record it, but it was really faint, and so I've boosted it as much as I can. When I got back, I checked it through BirdNet and I had a suspicion that it might have been a stock dove. And when I put it through BirdNet, I found it was. That's a first for me. I've never actually seen one, but I have now identified one locally through the sound. Actually, BirdNet is really useful. It's run by the Cornell Lab for Ornithology. And um, if you do have any bird recordings and you want to check, even if maybe you hear something unusual in your garden, Record it on your phone and then upload it to the bird net. It's brilliant for giving you suggestions for birds it might be. And it's, I would say, pretty accurate. So do try it out. On that walk, additional birds I saw to the earlier walk were Eurasian collared dove, common swift, lesser blackback gull, common buzzard, jay, marsh tit, barn swallow, black cap and nuthatch. Thanks to Douglas, who I met on the walk, for sharing the tips about the marsh tip. Thank you all so much for sharing your bird sightings with me. Jason Crane from the Jazz Session podcast sent me this recording. Hi, Susie. My name is Jason Crane, and I'm recording this on my phone, even though right next to me is the studio where I record my own podcast. But what this couch that I'm sitting on does have and the studio does not is a view of an Anna's hummingbird sitting on its nest. My partner and I live in Tucson, Arizona. We just moved here a couple months ago, and I'm definitely still learning the birds out here. But this morning, my partner happened to look up from the couch and see a nest in the eucalyptus trees that are outside the window of our second floor apartment. There was no bird in the nest then, but there is now. And she, I'm guessing it's she, is looking around with her beak slightly open. Uh, she's got a leaf that keeps popping her in the head, but she doesn't seem too annoyed by that fact. I can also hear some collared doves. There are a lot of collared doves uh, in the trees outside our apartment and uh, some Lucy's warblers as well. Although I can't see or hear them right at this moment, uh, but I know they're there because I was just outside. I'm watching this bird from the couch, uh, both as I mentioned, because I can actually see it from the couch, but also because it's 107 degrees Fahrenheit outside right now and uh, the couch is air conditioned. I don't know a ton about hummingbirds, so I can't say very much about you know what part of the nesting and birth process this might be. Uh, I am going to listen to your episode of Varmints, though, so I can learn more. I will be going in shortly to record my own podcast, but I wanted to spend as much time watching this hummingbird as I possibly could. And Faraz Abdul sent me this one. Right, you're listening to the tail end of the dawn chorus here in my backyard in Trinidad. Um, I am Faraz Abdul. I'm a photographer slash writer, but most importantly, very casual birder living in Trinidad and Tobago. The most prominent calls that you'll be hearing are carp grackles. I have 
two palm tanches that are looking at me and singing. And a pair of green round partlets that is right above my head. But they are being pretty quiet right now. Ruddy ground doves in the background. And our call you just heard is a grayish saltator. There's a saltator again. My partlets are looking at me. That lovely song is the song of the spectacled thrush. You're also hearing mild chattering of Green Room's partlets and that very strong call. That's a greyish saltator. Just had a banana quit come and look at me inquisitively. But yeah, all in all, just my backyard and Trinidad and Tobago. I know Ferez from Instagram, where he posts some amazing photographs of the birds he sees. Ferez shared a further recording with me. For that recording, he said, Amidst the din of banana quits and a couple of species of tanagers, the prominent calls are red eyed vireo, orange winged parrots, forest alania, grey fronted dove, and tropical kingbird. Thanks so much for sharing those sounds with us for us. I've listed the birds in the show notes, so do look them up online. They are beautiful. And Faraz will be joining us in a future episode to tell us more about his local birds. Jessica from Victoria, Australia, has been photographing a bird a day from her local area during the six-week lockdown and sharing them in the Facebook group. During this period, she's found that spotted pardalot are nesting nearby, seen eastern rosellas, a little wattle bird and a magpie lark in her garden, and shared some wonderful sightings from nearby parks. From earlier in the year, and produced with permission from Natasha in our Facebook group, here's a perfect day's casual birding. So she says, various bits of casual birding today. On my way to work, a gorgeous buzzard perched on the side of the road. Get out of the car at work and enjoy the house sparrows chattering. Spot one looking down at me from the roof. Lunchtime walk. I have a 20 minute or so route which takes me across golf links to the dunes along the beach. Totally undercover today as the tide was in. Absolutely delighted to hear and see my first skylark of the year. Then walking back through the small area of conifers, a goldcrest, a goldfinch and blue tip. Looking out of the window during the day, two dunnocks under the feeder. Only ever seen one there before, so this was a surprise. And a robin and blackbird, in addition to a host of house sparrows. Finished work, off to the airport. Had enough time for a very quick detour via a nature reserve en route. Never been before, so thought it was a good opportunity to check it out. Attention caught by a bird calling. Finally spotted it on a gorse bush. My first yellow hammer of 2020. Not doing its little bit of bread and no cheese song, or I think, hope, I would have identified it first by ear. Approaching the car, spotted a song thrush. Driving along the country roads from the nature reserve to the dual carriageway. Ooh, is that a bird of prey? No, wood pigeon. Mind the pheasant. On the dual carriageway, light beginning to fade. Rooks to the side of the road. Brief glimpse at 70 miles an hour, but definitely rooks. So congratulating myself on my Corvid identification skills. 19 species in the day, I think. See, that just goes to show how much casual birding you can do just through your usual day. Julian from Shropshire sent an email and he said, just wanted to say hello and a big thank you for your podcast, which I really enjoy listening to. At the end of the last episode, you said we should share audio files with you. Well, just last week, while walking my daughter to school, I heard a call I didn't recognise. 
I have the excellent app BirdNet on my phone, which identified it as a cold tip. My current aim is to learn as many calls and songs as I can. I like to think of it as tuning into a radio station where most people just hear static. Thank you so much for your kind words about the show, Julian. And I agree with you that listening to Birdsong is a little bit like being privileged to be able to hear a radio station where other people can only hear static. That's a lovely description. And I'd like to give a shout out to Robbie in San Pedro in California, uh, who sent me a lovely email and photo of the hummingbirds in his garden. From the beginning of the year, I've recorded the first bird I've seen and heard on the first day of each month. On September the 1st, the first bird I heard was a blue tit, and the first bird I saw was a rook. The 1st of October is coming up. Look out for my Twitter account, at CasualBirdapod, and tell me what you see or hear. Also, each week I run the What Bird Wednesday quiz, and on Sundays I ask you what top five birds or bird moments are that you've had during the week. I love reading your responses. Thanks to Marcus Oliver in the Facebook group for starting off the top five birds idea. And if you're talking about the show online, please do tag me in your comments. And don't forget to listen to the last call recording right at the end of the show. It's a segment of around five minutes of bird song and calls recorded by me in various locations around the world. You can find it right after the end credits. And this week's recording is the dawn calls from my garden in Hampshire on May the 3rd. What birds have you seen recently? I love to hear about them. Join our Facebook group to share your photos and tales of the birds you've seen. Find us at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash casual birder podcast. Follow me on Twitter at casual birder pod or on Instagram at casual birder podcast. And you can email me at casual pod at gmail.com. And do visit my website at casual where you'll find all the links and photos and videos of the birds I've seen and blog posts about my birding. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is short sleeve shirt by the drones Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast. Last Call Last Call this week is a recording of the bird song made at dawn from my garden in Hampshire, UK, on the 3rd of May. The main bird singing is Blackbird, but Robin, Dunnock, Wren, Carrion Crow and Wood Pigeon can be heard too. I hope you enjoy listening.